Good morning. Good morning, as always. It is good to see you. It's good to be with you. It's good to see your beautiful faces uh, this morning. Uh, we continue our series today in the book of First John. For those of you who are new over the past couple of months, we've been going through the book of First John, and we've been going through it verse by verse pretty much. And so today we are in chapter 5, verses 6 through 12. Got your Bibles? Please open them to 1 John chapter 5, verses 6 through 12. 1 John 5, 6 through 12. Let's, let's pray real quick and we'll, we'll get started. Father, we thank you again so much for this time together. Um, we thank you for bringing us together in this place, Father, for your glory and for our edification. Father, we pray that as we open your word this morning, that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts to embrace, minds to understand, whatever it is, Father, that you want to communicate to us today. Please speak. Use me, Father. Speak to your people. Do what only you can do, as you've already started doing in this place. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So 1 John chapter 5, verses 6 through 12. Now, as I was preparing for this sermon, as I was thinking about it, I couldn't help but thinking about the word testify or the word testimony. Uh, for the obvious reason that the word is mentioned multiple times in this passage that we're going to be reading today. So... I thought about doing a little bit of, a, of an audience participation, if you will, this morning. So what we'll do, I'll read the passage, and then I want you to keep track of how many times the word testify or testimony is mentioned as we read. And at the end, I'll ask you how many times, and then you'll say how many times you've, you've counted. I'm reading from the ESV translation. I think the NIV has the same count. And so, so let's get started. First John 5, 6 through 12. It says this. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree. If we receive the testimony of men... The testimony of God is greater, for this is the testimony of God that he has borne concerning his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar, because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. How many times did we count the word testimony or testify? Anybody want to shout it? Eight times. That's what I got. Eight times. Now, it's mentioned eight times in this short passage, or verses 6 through 12. Now, it's important, right? We've got to talk about it. So let's talk about the word testify, the word testimony, as we open up today. The Greek word for the word testify is martyrio. And the Greek word for the word testimony, it's pretty much the same word, is martyria. It's going to be right here. Now, maybe you notice the English word martyr in this word, right? This is not a coincidence. Uh, the Greek word for the word martyr is actually the word martus, and it means witness. Now, I want you to notice this because the word witness, martus, and the word martirio, martiria, they're etymologically related. They share the same root. In the Greek Old Testament, 
The word witness, martus, refers to someone who bears witness before a judgment is made. Right? A martus or a witness is someone who attests to a fact or to an event. Someone who gives evidence about something. It is someone who has seen or someone who has personal knowledge of something or someone. That's the word martus, witness connected or related to the word testimony or the word testify. It wasn't until later on, when the disciples started being persecuted, that the word martus became associated with the idea of suffering and dying. Before then, just a legal term, a witness. In short, a witness is someone who testifies again about something. It is someone who gives a testimony about something or about someone. Now, I read this from the United States Department of Justice website as I was preparing for this, and it reads this. A witness in court is a person who can provide information about a case, such as having seen or heard a crime or having important information about the defendant or crime. Witnesses can be called by either the defense or the prosecution to testify or to tell what they know about the situation. The information a witness provides is called testimony and is used as evidence to help the court understand what happened. This evidence can corroborate or contradict claims made by other parties involved in the case or may even influence the outcome. Now, I love this part right here. Before giving their testimony, witnesses are required to promise to tell the truth. I love this. They may also be asked to prepare for cross-examination, which can include practicing how to stay calm, speak clearly, and answer questions slowly and confidently. Love this. It, it's, it, it squares with what we're going to be talking about. Now, this idea of using witnesses in a court hearing has its roots way back in ancient Israel jurisprudence, way back. Now, in the Mosaic law, the law of Moses, no person can be convicted of a crime without the testimony of at least two people. You need two or three witnesses to be able to convict somebody of a crime. In Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15, the Bible says this, a single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or for any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. Only, only on the evidence of two witnesses or three witnesses shall a charge be established. Now, this is important because the giving of false testimony was a serious matter. If you were to give false testimony about somebody, you would be given the punishment which the person you testified against, wrongly against, would suffer. This was serious. Now, I, I bring this all up. This is why I bring this up. I bring this up because the word testimony, again, the word testify is mentioned eight times in these few verses. But more importantly, very importantly, because one of the themes of this book, of the book of First John, is a defense of the true identity of Jesus. If you recall, there were some people who believed that Jesus, although he was God, he was the Son of God, but he wasn't, he wasn't really human, right? Since Jesus as God could not die. So John, in defending the true identity of Jesus, he presents a testimony about Jesus. John, in defending the true identity of Jesus, again, he presents a testimony about Jesus. The Apostle John understands that if he is to effectively assure believers of the certainty of their faith, if he is to help them become certain of their faith, as he states as his goal for writing this book, it is absolutely necessary 
that they get Jesus right. They can't be wrong about the true biblical Jesus. Now, to better walk you through this passage, I've decided to divide it into two major points. It's going to be very simple. Two major points. Number one, the ultimate witness. We're going to talk about the ultimate witness, number one. And number two, we'll talk about the ultimate testimony. Number one, the ultimate witness. And number two, the ultimate testimony. So starting with number one, the ultimate witness. In the beginning of the book, the beginning of 1 John, John appeals to himself and other eyewitnesses of Jesus to attest to the truth about Jesus' divinity and humanity. If you remember in 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, John says this, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, he's talking about himself and the other eyewitnesses, which we've seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, appealing to himself as an eyewitness and appealing to the other apostles as eyewitnesses as well. Now, to strengthen his case about the true identity of Jesus, what does he do in 1 John chapter 5, this passage? He appeals to God himself to Yahweh himself, God the Father, he appeals to him as the ultimate witness of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Now let's, let's look at it here, verses 6 through 8, real quick. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. Now, he mentions three things right off the bat. Water, blood, and Spirit. Now, this is ad admittedly a little bit confusing. And all the commentaries I've read over the past week admit that. They, it, it's a confusing passage. There have been various interpretations, right? I understand that the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, can be a witness, right? The Holy Spirit in biblical theology is the third person of the Trinity. So I get that, that the Holy Spirit testifies about Jesus. Jesus says it, right? In John chapter 15, verse 26, Jesus says, but when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. Clear. But what about water and blood? How does water and blood testify about Jesus? I wrote about a number of interpretations, a couple of them here. Number one, some people believe that water and blood refer to the sacraments. Water referring to baptism, and blood referring to the Lord's Supper. That's one interpretation. Another one is that water and blood are connected to the water and blood that came out from Jesus' side when he was pierced by the spear at his crucifixion. I don't know if you remember that, but the, there was a soldier who wanted to see if Jesus was dead or was still alive. He, he pierced them on the side with a spear, and then water and blood came out. Some people believe that the water and the blood that we're reading about here that John mentions refer to that water and blood that came out of Jesus' sight. That's another interpretation. Another one that I particularly like is that water refers to Jesus' birth and blood refers to his crucifixion. I like that because as you read the book of 1 John, you see John making the case for both the deity of Jesus, his divinity, and his humanity. So that would make sense that water would be referring to his birth, his natural birth, physical birth, if you will. And the one that I like the most is that water refers to the baptism of Jesus, 
when he was declared the Son of God and when he was commissioned by God for his work. And then blood would refer to his death when he completed the work on the cross. Now, based on my reading of 1 John particularly, I would pick the last one, that water is referring here to Jesus' baptism and blood is referring to his crucifixion. Now, those two words, water and blood, they point to two very important events which I believe confirm the reality of the deity of Jesus and his incarnation. We'll talk about it. Now, remember when Jesus wanted to get baptized, it was time for him to get baptized, he went to the Jordan River, went to John, and he says, John, I'm, I'm ready to get baptized. And John was like, hey, Jesus, I, I want to be baptized by you. I need to be baptized by you. And Jesus answers in, in verse 15, Matthew 3, verse 15, let it be so now, for those it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And the Bible says in verses 16 and 17, And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son. Please don't miss this. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. This is God the Father himself testifying to the divine origin of Jesus. This is God the Father himself stating, hey, this is my son. We share the same essence. This is God the Father himself, not only testifying to the divine origin of Jesus, but anointing him for the blood shedding work ahead of him. So what happened at Jesus' baptism is important because this is the testimony of the ultimate witness of God himself. Again, this is my son, and whom I am well pleased. Now, this is more about the character of the witness. I understand that the author here uses three witnesses, if you will, right? Water, blood, and the spirit to sort of keep up with, you know, the demand of the Mosaic law that you needed two or three witnesses to prove a case. But this is more about the character of the witness more than it is about the plurality of the witnesses which is why I believe in verse 9, if you look at it, John says this in our key verse, key passage, if you will. He says, if we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater, for this is the testimony of God that he has borne concerning his son. You see it? And logic, this is the argument from the lesser to the greater. Right? If, if something is less likely is true, if something less likely is true, then something more likely will probably be true as well. I'll, I'll repeat this. If something less likely is true, then something more likely will probably be true as well. For example, if my, if my three-year-old son Bryce can pick up a 25-pound dumbbell, Francois, he's probably not here, or Jacob can pick up a 25-pound dumbbell. That's what it is, right? If something less likely is true, then something more likely will probably be true. If we're willing to accept the testimony of two or three human witnesses, human beings being subject to errors, flaws, and mistakes, how much more should we be willing to accept the testimony of God? I think that's the argument that John is making to his readers here. And in passing, I'll say, beloved, Christianity is not a blind faith. God does not commend us to simply close our eyes and believe. Christianity is not a blind faith. The object of our faith is God Almighty, the creator 
of the heavens and the earth. If we're willing to accept the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. This is about the character of God himself, that he is holy, that he is pure, that he is transcendent, that God Almighty is self-sufficient. He's in a class by himself. He is life, light, love. I love this quote by the great British theologian Adam Clark. He, he says this, God is the eternal, independent, and self-existent being, the being whose purposes and actions spring from himself without foreign motive or influence. He who is absolute in dominion, the most pure, the most simple, the most spiritual of all essences, infinitely perfect and eternally self-sufficient, needing nothing that he has made, illimitable in his immensity, inconceivable in his mode of existence, and indescribable in his essence, known fully only by himself, because an infinite mind can only be comprehended by itself. In a word, a being from his infinite wisdom cannot err or cannot be deceived. And from his infinite goodness can do nothing but what is eternally just and right and kind. This is the object of our faith. This is the ultimate witness. And in verse 10, John says, whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. But whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. God, Yahweh, is the ultimate witness and he has testified about his Son. Now, point number two, the ultimate testimony. If God has testified about his son, what is that testimony? What constitutes this, that testimony? What is the content, if you will, of that testimony? Now, I think verse 11 answers it very clearly. Let's, let's read it. 1 John 5, 11. It says this. And this is the testimony, very plain, very simple. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life and this life is in his son. This is the testimony that God gave us eternal life and that this life is in his son. Now, let, let, let's try to explain this. There's, there's a connection here that I'd like to make for you that, that I want to show you real quick. So 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Let, let's, let's see what it says. So 1 John, same book, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. It says this. That which was from the beginning, which we've heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, verse 2. The life was made manifest, and we've seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. What does verse 11 says in chapter 5? And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life and that this life is in his Son. The life that was with God in the beginning. This is the miracle. Please don't miss it. The life that was with God in the beginning. What does he do with this? With it, with it. He gave it to us. In the Gospel of John, instead of using the word life, John uses the word word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. But now in this epistle, he uses the word life 
instead of word. The life was with God in the beginning, 1 John 5, 11. This is the testimony, this is the miracle that God gave us eternal life. Eternal life is Jesus. Jesus is eternal life. Eternal life was with God in the beginning, and he gave us eternal life. The Son of God, he gave us eternal life. Jesus says of himself in John chapter 14, verse 6, he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In verse 12, in our key passage, whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. Now, this is the content of the testimony that God again gave us eternal life and that this life is in his Son. Now, the implication of this reality, beloved, is mind-blowing. Because to have Jesus is to have eternal life, and to have eternal life again is to have Jesus. Now, I want you to notice, to pay attention to, to verse 12 here. It says, whoever has the Son has life. I want you to think about this for a moment. Whoever has the Son has life. Not whoever has the Son will have life, right? Not whoever has the Son probably will have life. But whoever has the Son has life, present tense. This means that if you confess Jesus as Lord and Savior today, right now, you have eternal life. This is the implication. If Jesus, if you've confessed him as your Lord and Savior, if you've acknowledged him, that he came and, and died for you to atone for your sins, you now have eternal life. Whoever has the Son has life. And, and this, this may be new for, for some of you here, but I'll, I'll say it. I'll, I'll say something, but before you, before you gasp, please Give me some time to explain, okay? I'll, I'll say something real quick. There it is. Heaven is not eternal life. Your guaranteed seat in heaven is not eternal life. It's, it's an implication of eternal life. It's an extension of eternal life. But heaven in and of itself is not eternal eternal life. What I'm trying to say is that some of us are so busy worrying about how things are now that we've forgotten that we now have eternal life. We've forgotten that we have Jesus now. We have forgotten that we have the Holy Spirit of God in us now. We have forgotten that eternal life is a present reality as much as it is a future hope. To have Jesus is, is what it means to have eternal life. And so maybe you're here and you, you're not a believer. You don't believe in, in this Christianity thing. Or, or maybe you've been coming to church for, for quite some time, but... You're not sure if you saved. Maybe you've been going to church for a long time. Maybe you've confessed Jesus as your Lord, but quite frankly, you feel burdened. You feel crushed today. Maybe you've come to think of Christianity as a list of do's and don'ts, a list of rules to keep, and only if you keep those rules will you attain heaven or eternal life? Well, if, that, if that's you, let, let, me share, let me share those words with you straight from Jesus, Matthew 11, verses 28, 30. 
He says this, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Rest is being offered to you now. Eternal life is being offered to you now. There's only one thing you need to do, and it is to come to Jesus. That's it, to come to Jesus, and he will give you rest. To acknowledge him as Savior, and you instantly at that moment have eternal life. And so, beloved, the ultimate witness, the ultimate witness of the biblical Jesus is God himself, is Yahweh. His ultimate witness, the ultimate witness of the God incarnate, of God, of the God-man, is the Father himself, Yahweh. And his testimony is this, that God gave us eternal life, and that this life is in his son. The life, again, which was with God in the beginning, he gave us this life. This is the greatest miracle, that we have been given eternal life, the life that was with God in the beginning. And so the question we can ask as we wrap this up this morning is, what do we do with this life that we've been given? What do we do with the eternal life that we've been graciously granted. I, I think it's pretty simple as we read this book, First John. I, I think the way we, what we do with this life is that we testify about it through our obedience to God and through our love for one another. I think as you read the, the book of First John, that's what you'll see, right? The way we testify about Jesus, or we testify about the eternal life that we now possess is through our obedience to God and through our love for one another. After all, we are living testimony. Romans 8, 16 says this, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. This is our job description. We are living testimony. We are witnesses of the risen Christ. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Beloved, we are beneficiaries of God's testimony about his son. We have the testimony. We have been graciously granted the testimony. We are beneficiaries of the life which was, in the beginning, Jesus Christ himself. And so what do we do with that life? We live it. We testify about it through our obedience to God's commands and through our love for one another. Pray with me.